Good evening. My name is Kurt Frank. I am the executive editor of The Blade, and I welcome you here tonight for Authors Authors. Our guest tonight is Luis Rodriguez, and we want to again celebrate our 20th year of inspiration and excellence with our Authors Authors program, which is presented by The Blade and handled by the library. Before we introduce tonight's guest, I want to do a little housekeeping to let you know about future Authors Authors that will be coming up. We close out our final author, our authors, on May the 20th. Uh, it's a Friday, and it's at the Stranahan Theater. We're delighted to welcome Emmy-winning creator of The Simpsons and Futurama, Matt Groening, as well as his sidekick, an award-winning graf graphic novelist, Linda Berry. Matt and Linda will present Love, Hate, and Comics, The Friendship That Will Never Die in which the legendary uh, cartoonists and the former classmates, they were college classmates more than 40 years ago, and they'll, be talk about, they'll talk about love, hate, comics, and their perpetual joy of driving each other crazy. Now, if you have any questions about that performance that they will have or anything about the Authors Authors series, we invite you to go to toledolibrary.org or the Blades website at toledoblade.com. I would also like to call your attention while you're at the library tonight or any time in the future to stop by the library's gallery where there is an exhibit going on called Fair Share of the Harvest. It's a photographic history of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, also known as FLOC, it's a retrospective of Northwest Ohio's Farm Labor Organizing Committee, which was co-founded by Baltimore Velasquez in the mid-1960s to give migrant farm workers a voice. Today, FLOC has grown into a very powerful labor union representing more than 20,000 workers in the Midwest and North Carolina. I would also like to recognize some of the members of the Flocks Leadership Union Program in the audience this evening. The program is geared toward young people ages 14 to 24, and its mission is to reduce the barriers to employment and build a network of leaders in the community. Enough about this. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's introducer, Jason Kuchma who will introduce our guest tonight. Jason is the Deputy Director of the Lucas County Public Library. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Uh, first off, where are the homies? You got some here? There they are. They're in the back, in the back corner. Welcome. We're glad to have you all here tonight. Uh, as Kurt mentioned, my name is Jason Kuchma. I'm the Deputy Director of your Toledo Lucas County Public Library. And I'm really pleased to introduce our guest tonight. Um, our guest is convinced that a writer can change the world. Through education and power of words, he saw his own way out of poverty and despair from the barrio of East LA and successfully broke free from the years of violence and desperation spent as an active gang member. Achieving success as an award-winning Chicano poet, he was sure that the streets would haunt him no more until his son joined the gang himself. He fought for his child by telling his own story in the bestseller, Always Running, La Vida Loca, Gang Days in LA, a vivid memoir that explores the motivation of gang life, the cautions against the death and destruction that inevitably claims its participants. Among other honors, he holds the distinct honor of being named one of the 100 most censored authors by the American Library Association. <laughs> that deserves a round of applause. Through his award-winning poetry, collections, books for children, fiction, and community reform advocacy, he addresses the complex but vital issues of race, class, gender, and personal rage through dialogue, story, poetry, and art. Our guest was one of 50 leaders worldwide selected as Unsung Heroes of Compassion, presented by the Dalai Lama, and in 2014, he was appointed the Los Angeles Poet Laureate. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guest tonight, Luis Rodriguez. How's everybody doing? 
so can you all hear me good? Okay. It's really an honor to be here. I, I have to tell you that my favorite places in the world are libraries. And there's a reason for it. I'm going to share one of the reasons. Um, when I was uh, selected as poet laureate of the city of Los Angeles in 2014, they actually gave me the award in the big central library there. And um, the mayor was there and he gave me this award. And I told him a story that he didn't know. When I was 15, oh, can you all hear me louder and louder? Let me see, let me see if I even got it on. Looks like it's on. Oh no. Is that better? Is that better? There you go. Okay, so, <laughs> technology, I can't, anyway. Um, what happened though is that when I was 15 years old, I was homeless in those streets of LA. And I used to um, do heroin. I was a heroin addict for seven years. And I was in the streets and I would always, I even, I'm just being honest with you, I was a criminal, a petty criminal, just to be, you know, be honest. I wasn't a big time gangster. I was just a, doing a lot of dumb things. But I had a, a 22 handgun that I would use to mug people in Chinatown and, and Overa Street, which is the Mexican little hangout there, the Pueblo there. And, uh, and I remember that I would hang with all the homeless people during the day, but at night I didn't trust anybody, so I wouldn't sleep in the same place twice, and I always slept by myself. I wouldn't, they always say, hey, come and hang with us. There's little encampments here and there, and I said, no, no. I would always find a place to sleep. Usually along the LA River, there was always places to be able to sleep. Abandoned cars, which they don't have anymore, but they used to find them and break into them. Uh, all night movie theaters, I don't know if you guys had them in Toledo, but I remember all night movie theaters, I'd sneak in there and get up in the morning when they throw everybody out. Um, you know, I always found a place to sleep. Church pews, when they, they stopped closing them, you know, there was always some place. But my refuge during the day, the best place was that central library, the same library that I was getting this award. And I remember because I loved reading those books. And I'll tell you something about books. Books never beat me up. They never told me I never mount to anything. They never diminished me. They were always places where I could imagine I could dream, I could connect with others. I loved so many books, but I have to mention one um, author, Ray Bradbury, a uh, science fiction writer. Um, he used to write that, I didn't know this, and a typewriter, and I say it like this, because this is why I used to do typewriting, but you know, he would actually write his stories there in that library, and I didn't know this. But um, I, those books were important, and I think they were my saving grace in the long run. Uh, why would I love books? I wasn't good at language. My first language was Spanish. I came to Los Angeles when I was two years old from Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, even though I was born across the border. And um, I went to school in Watts. School, Watts, even today, is some of the worst schools you ever can imagine. And I was in a school with mostly African-American kids who were actually great to me, but what the school would do, not the kids so much, the school would punish you if you spoke Spanish. And I can remember one time I spoke it in the playground and they took me to the office and I got swatted. You know, those boards of education with the hose in it, you know, so. And uh, that was terrible because they didn't teach us English very well. So I was incommunicable, practically. But the one thing about the books is that when I was about 10 years old, a teacher read Charlotte's Web out loud. And I loved it. I loved it. I don't know about anybody else, but I totally loved it. And I was um, enthralled by just the story, the, the word. So what happened is I would read Charles Webb like 20 times, you know? And I started just reading as many books as I could. That's what helped me in many ways. And I didn't know that that was gonna be my destiny. I wanna show you some things, because I don't always get a chance to do this. Um, I brought as many of my books as I could. You know why? because people don't know how many books I actually have. They, they, always, they always think it's always running, that's it. And uh, I'm always telling them I got many more books than that. I'm just showing you, so you have an idea. I even got CDs, DVDs, and um, probably the, the doll somewhere in here. Um, I just got so much, look at, these are my books that I published. And I do remember being told by teachers when I was growing up that I would never amount to anything. Can you imagine? English teachers. And I would like them to know this is what happened to somebody who doesn't believe that, who tries not to believe it. Because now look at, I have written these books. 
And I have another little story related to that. One time, and this is, a, and this is why I know destiny plays in our lives. We may not always know how it does it. But I was walking there, homeless, in those, walking in those shelves, and there was no Luis Rodriguez's, there was no Sanchez's, there was no Garcia's. You never could see any Spanish language names. But one day, I looked up and I thought I saw my name on the spine of one of the books. And it was so quick, and then it died as soon as I looked over. It wasn't my name, obviously. But I was really seeing something in the future. I didn't know that my destiny was calling me. And it was calling me in such a way that I eventually became all about books. And not only do I have these books that I've written, but I also publish books. I have a publishing house called Tia Chucha Press. We've done more than 60 books in the last 27 years. And I even have a bookstore. I have a bookstore in the San Fern Northeast San Fernando Valley, the Mexican side of the valley, um, that has 500,000 people, which I understand is even more than the Toledo area. Uh, but there was no bookstores, nowhere. No movie houses, no culture centers. 15 years ago, me and my wife started this beautiful place called Tia Chuchas, the only bookstore, culture center, movie house. And I mean movie house, because we show movies every once in a while, we don't really have a theater. But anyway, it's like, for, for these people who didn't have that, there was, and this is in the entertainment capital of the world, LA, Hollywood, everything. Miles and miles, you go to South Central LA, go to East LA, go to that part of the valley, nothing going on culturally. And, um, and I'm, so now I have a bookstore. I'm all about books, everywhere I go. And uh, I think it's important because um, books are also really more deeper. It's about story, and it's about voice. It's about the stories that don't get told, the stories that really make up this country, the stories and the voices that often are pushed aside and yet they're part of the fabric of who we are. Everything we are is mixed in with these stories. And, um, and I think it's important for everybody to recognize how we are intersect as people. That even though we might think we don't, and maybe we all live in different kinds of neighborhoods, I totally intersect with all the people that have been in this country before me and that are here now. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, anything that you think is, quote, American has roots in some other culture. And that's the way it should be. Um, I remember uh, when I was in California, anybody from California? Just a few, okay. There used to be a long time ago, big battles between the surfers and the beaners. You may not understand what the heck this is about, but the surfers were all generally the white kids, and the beaners were all the Mexicans. And they would clash all the time. But you know, surfing actually comes from the Hawaiian people, the indigenous people of Hawaii. They created that beautiful c culture, which now it's all over the world. You know, uh, I heard that in India, there's girls, young girls doing surfing. You know, it's like it's all over the world. Um, cowboys, how many love cowboys? And you all know that cowboys came from the vaquero. A lot of people don't know this. The vaquero was the Mexican cowboys that were there that the, when the Americans, came, and I'm talking about Anglo-Americans mostly coming from the uh, East Coast, ended up there, they saw these sitting around a campfire playing the Spanish guitar, singing songs, and then the way they would do the lariats. In fact, the word lariat comes from uh, a Spanish word for that, which I'm not even sure, larieta, I think it is. And they would actually, um, the horses, they would actually, the way they taught how to use the horses. And here's the interesting thing, you heard about cowboys and Indians? Well, the first cowboys there were actually Indians. They were Indians from Mexico and that part of the world. And there wasn't that many Spanish, by the way. The Spanish were the overlords. So they would just get the Indians and Hispanicize them. And one of the ways they would do it is make vaqueros out of them. So even cowboys is part of our culture, but it comes from another culture. Um, rock and roll, right? Nothing more American than rock and roll. But rock and roll is a mixture of so many things, in particular, a mixture of Africa. People don't want to always think about how Africa has influenced the beats, the sounds, the music, and everything that we, that we listen to. It became the blues, and then from the blues it became jazz, and from the jazz it started evolving, evolving, and now you have this thing called rock and roll, which is all over the place. But you always remember the beats, and, uh, and that's why it's important that we recognize, and I'm just touching the surface, I'm not even talking about all the cultures, that we all contributed to making, how about martial arts? How many like martial arts? I grew up, you know what I thought martial arts were? Because no Mexicans were getting into martial arts. It was all another white person thing. It wasn't a white person thing, but they were the ones in their neighborhood that had the martial arts classes. And I, I didn't know that it actually came from Asia. 
and there was martial arts that came from Asia, and they, they brought it over here. And I'll tell you something else, one of the best fighters ever in martial arts, before MMA, and I'm a big MMA fan, was a guy named Benny the Jet Ugidas, a Chicano, undefeated, world champion, martial artist. Look him up, Ugidas, Benny the Jet, from the Northeast San Fernando Valley, where also Richie Valens came from. You remember Richie Valens? Northeast San Fernando Valley. How about Cheech Marin, the comedian? <laughs> Northeast San Fernando Valley. How about George Rodriguez? I'm sorry, George Lopez. <laughs> I, all these Mexican names, I get them all mixed up. <laughs> George Lopez, he's also from the Northeast San Fernando Valley. A lot of these people that we think are from East LA are actually from that part of the valley. So I mention all this just to point out that we are one people with so much diversity, it's who we are, it's in our nature. And we have to recognize it, accept it, and understand it. Uh, I um, am personally tied to my indigenous roots in Mexico. Do you know how much native people we are as Mexicans? And to me it's very important because uh, it's been taken away, rooted out in Mexico a lot, but also coming here. Dia Chuchas has its own resident Aztec dance group. And they got permission from people connected to Mexico. And uh, they, they do big giant events. And this Saturday, we're gonna celebrate our quinceanera, 15 years in that place. And we're gonna have two hours of Mexica danza, Aztec dance for two hours. People are gonna be there. Because it's not performance, it's ceremony, it's blessing. In other words, we go back, we teach the kids in my center, the Nahuatl language, the Nahuatl language, the old so-called Aztec language, which is actually one of the largest languages in the Americas, and it's still spoken by millions of people in Mexico, but a lot of people don't talk about it. Now it's coming up again. And, uh, and I'm trying to, we're trying to resurrect it, because it's a beautiful language. I did a big reading in LA called Endangered Languages, which we had people that were speaking Welsh, which is now being endangered in the British Isles, speaking, um, a lot of Indian languages from India, Southeast of India that's being thrown out, uh, languages of the Garfuno people out of Honduras. All these languages are not, are not being used hardly anymore. They're bringing them back. And I did a poem in Nahuatl, just so people would not forget that we also have those beautiful ties. Uh, I want to mention all this because, again, this to me is the richness of who we are as people and who we are as a country. And we need to celebrate that richness. I really have to point out that it bothers me and it will bother me until it stops that somebody in these presidential nomination nations are talking about walls, talking about that certain people don't belong here, talking about, I mean, to me, we have the worst discourse I've ever seen in the political situation and we have got to do whatever we can to change it. Um, and if, and if you're a Republican, I think that's great, it's fine. I actually have members of my family who are Republican. You shouldn't stand for it, you know, it shouldn't happen. People shouldn't be talking this way. Shouldn't, people shouldn't be using these things. There's gotta be a discourse of language that allows us to find the commonality within the, in, you know, the diversity, the unity within all this variance that we have. And language, like poetry, has to come out, right? So that we don't forget that poetry is one of the essential ways of talking soul to soul. So I'm gonna share a few things, but I wanna share a poem that I actually wrote when I was in jail. Now, you guys, some of you might have read Always Winning, you may not have. I'm not gonna get into all of it, but I will touch upon some of it. I was on murder's row when I was 16 years old, and they were trying to get me for the murders of three people, and I had a cell next to Charles Manson. You guys all know Charles Manson? And, um, and in the first night I was there, and I was 16 years old, you're not supposed to be until you're 18, but just so you know, nobody follows the laws. You think they do, they don't. You know, they just do what they would want to do. I had a 13 year old there with us, because they were trying to get us for these murders, and they, got, they rounded up five of us, put us in there, and um, the first night I was there, the two murders whose cell was in were trying to get this 13 year old kid. So I became his protector. And I could do it, I was good for it, because I've been in the street a long time, you know? And the only thing I know about the street is this, just so you know, don't ever show fear. You just come, don't show no fear. I don't care what's going on, I don't care if somebody's got a gun in your head, you put your face closer to that gun. You know what I mean? Somebody put a razor blade to my neck that first night, and I just told him, you better make sure I'm good and dead, because if I'm not, I'm gonna kill you. That's where you gotta be. 
I, I'm scared, so what? You know? And obviously I don't want to die, but you have to be, you can't snivel, you can't be groveling, you can't, be, you can't do that. You just have to say, kill me. And if you don't, then you're in trouble. You know? And that's just the way you have to do it. And sure enough, I did that, and the people that were putting the razor blades started to laugh and thought it was funny. And then we played cards all night long. I said, well, it's cool. <laughs> this is what you have to do in that world. And so here's what happens. I'm sitting in there. By the way, I didn't get charged for the murders. They eventually let me go, um, which I can always explain later how that happened. But I'm sitting there, and people are drawing. People are playing cards. People are wasting time. They don't got much to do. They're sitting there. None the, jail, I don't care what anybody says, is boring. People think it's all exciting, it's mostly boring. But I start writing. Again, those books speaking to me, the destiny calling me, coming through me. I don't know how to write, but I'm starting writing. And these became my first poems. And I'm gonna share with you one of the first poems I ever wrote. Again, just so you know, it was badly written. I fixed it up years later, just, you know, it didn't come out all this way, but. I, the, the seeds of it were there. And it's called The Calling because I really do felt I was, I really do feel I was being called to be this person. Somehow, the heavens, nature, guardian angels, God, whatever you want to say, had, gave me this, how do you say, this pull, this thread that I needed to hang on. And the thread has pulled me through to this point. It goes like this. The calling came to me while I languished in my room, while I withered away my youth in jail cells and damp barrio fields. It called me to life out of captivity in a street scarred and tattooed place I call body. Until then I waited silently, a deafening clamor in my head, voiceless to all around, hidden from America's eyes, a brown boy without a name. I would sing into a solitary tape recorder, music never to be heard. I would write my thoughts in scrambled English. I would take photos in my mind, plan out new parks, bushy green, concrete free, new places to play and think, waiting. Then it came, the calling. It brought me out of my room. It forced me to escape the night captures in street prisons. It called me to war, to be writer, to be scientist, and march with the soldiers of change. It called me from the shadows, out of the wreckage of my barrio, from among those who did not exist. I waited all of 16 years for this time. Somehow, unexpected, I was called. So, thank you. Um, soon after I found my passion, my destiny, I began to meet fighters in the civil rights struggles of the country in the 60s and 70s. And I think that was a great time for me to be born. I think if I had been born out of that, I wouldn't be here. They gave me purpose, that my writing, my thoughts, my ideas could actually be to help better this country. And I decided to be a leader in that field. And I met mentors in the Chicano movement, the Movimiento. These people were Chicanos at Mexican descent who were beginning to fight back. And they started a long time ago, but at that time was really in East LA. It was really, I was in the East LA at the time. They were really organizing, protesting marches, all kind of things were happening. They were pulling street kids like me, gang kids, out of the gangs, teaching us to be leaders. And you know what? The gang violence in East LA, which used to be one of the worst, most gang infested, it used to be the gang capital of the world at one point, it stopped for a while because young people were starting to get active organized, going to school, going to college. I was one of those that they pulled out of the madness. And I was a high school dropout, like I said, I was homeless, I was on heroin, I was in bad shape, and I met one of these leaders at the community center. And I'll tell you the, the real quick story, I love st stories, but this is the one where I, they had just started, my little neighborhood, by the way, and for those who don't know about LA, was the poorest neighborhood in LA County. It was called South San Gabriel, not belonging to any city, it was county territory, just like parts of Watts, parts of East LA. These are areas that no, not even LA City wants them. People think they're part of LA, but they're not. They're actually unincorporated. They call them unincorporated. So South San Gabriel was surrounded by suburban white communities, but it was an old migrant camp that uh, used to work the fields, and the fields were gone. Now they built suburbs, but the camp stayed. We had dirt roads. We had no sidewalks. 
we had goats and chickens and uh, you know little shacks and everything, but surrounded by nice suburbs with sidewalks and malls and all these things. And so we were at war not just with other neighborhoods, other radios, we were at war with these people who had money. You know what I'm saying? But here's the interesting thing that people don't know, or I'll, I'll let you know. The community started as a poor white neighborhood. It started with the Okies and the Arkies. You know who they are? They were the ones that left the Dust Belt in the 30s and they ended up in California. They were the migrant workers at the time. Uh, John Steinbeck wrote books about them. And uh, that's what they started. It started in South San Gabriel. And they actually named the neighborhood Wilmar. They named it Wilmar because there was a town in Arkansas named Wilmar. So the first little gang there was Wilmar, and their symbol was a donkey. Yeah, I'm just letting you know, in the 30s, these were poor white kids, and they had a little gang. It was called Wilmar, and they had a donkey as their symbol. And they had little tattoos, rough tattoos at that time. So, but by the 40s, it was all Mexican. So by the time I moved in there in the 60s and then 70s, it was mostly Mexican, except you still had some of those old white families, some of the old Arky, Arky, Arky and Oki families. So you had this Mexican radio with all these brown-skinned people, and every once in a while, a guy, white dude will pop up talking Spanish like the rest of us, because he grew up there. We never saw them as white people. We saw them as homies. You know what I'm saying? They were part of the neighborhood. And, uh, and so we never saw them as anything different. They were homies, and we treated them like homies, you know? Uh, there was one black guy who ended up in the neighborhood because he was AWOL from, from the Army, and he ended up homeless there, and we found him, and we jumped him in the barrio, and now he became our, one of our homies, too, you know? It wasn't about race. It was about, you know, you're, you're poor, you're, you're, with, you're out of it, you're with us in a little community here, you're one of us, you know? So that was the neighborhood that I came out of, and somehow, in the early 70s, somebody had this bright idea, I don't know who, why they did it, to build a little cultural center there. I don't know where they got this idea, out of nowhere. And it was a youth center with another center and they even had a preschool and an alternative school. I don't know who came up with this thing. So here I am, graffiti artist, heroin addict, gang member, I shot people, I even stabbed people by then. I come in there the night before and I break in and I graffiti all the walls. That's what I do. And I don't mean tagging. I'm talking about heavy duty, big pieces. It took me hours to do them, you know, uh, with flashlights, you know, and I'm just painting all the stuff. And then I'm coming out, and I'm, next morning, they had their opening. And they opened the doors, and they were, oh my God, look what happened. It's all graffiti with all the, it's all gang stuff. It wasn't great and beautiful stuff, it was just gang stuff. But I showed up that morning to see my handiwork, you know, hey, I want to see, you know. And they recognized me, so they, they, they stopped me and they held me and said, you know, we, we call the cops. They had just hired a youth counselor, the youth just hired him. They told the guy to get me, send me to this office. He held me, put me in the office. They told him to call the cops, but I will tell you what this guy did. He didn't call the cops. He just talked to me for the longest time. He ended up being my mentor. who took the time to care about somebody he didn't have to care about. And what he told me was, you're an artist. Why don't you paint a mural? I don't know what he was talking about. He said, I'm not an artist. I never went to school. I don't know what I'm doing. I love this graffiti. He said, no, no, you're an artist. And then he showed me a book, this thick, of Mexican murals. You know, Rivera, Siqueiros, Orozco. In the 20s, they were changing the whole world of public art because they were painting murals everywhere. And then, at the very end of the book, is all these great Mayan temples with murals everywhere. Because I don't know if people don't know, but these temples were, had murals outside and inside. Well, with time, they all kind of washed away or they weren't that strong, but they were all murals everywhere. And he was telling me this is part of my culture, part of my roots, and I didn't know what he was talking about. Nobody ever told me this. Nobody ever shared with me that I had something. And it opened my eyes. It made me realize there's something, I didn't have to be dying every day, wanting to die every day, because that's what I was doing. I was committing a slow suicide, you know. The heroin, that was just a way to die. Uh, getting shot at, I got shot at half a dozen times. I would. And I never got hit, by the way. 
machine gun fire, point blank range, and never got hit. I mean, I'm talking about, if people around me were getting hit, I lost 25 friends by the time I was 18. But I wasn't, I was standing there, I wanted to die. I used to stand in the corners like a pendejo, you know what that means. And just come kill me, you know, and it wasn't happening. But he showed me what my roots were, and they were deep. And then we made an agreement. And the only reason I made an agreement because nobody ever bothered to give me the time of day. And I didn't even know what I was doing. He says, I'll help you learn how to paint murals if you go back to high school. You know, he wasn't just going to do things for me. He wanted me to do something. I hated high school. I didn't want to go to high school, but you know what? I, I wanted to paint murals. It's intriguing. Yeah, let me try this. Sure enough, I painted eight murals when I was 17 years old with uh, 13 gang kids, and then I did some of my own. I even did one at the local library, which, by the way, the local library is about, was about the size of maybe that little room area. <laughs> I'm talking about a small little place with a few books, but I painted murals on the walls, beautiful murals. And um, he got me into high school. And it, again, somebody who cared, somebody who just said, I see you. You know what I mean? I see something else in you, which we hardly ever do anymore because I'm a tattooed, I had a lot of tattoos. Uh, in those days, we were all tattooed. Nobody was tattooed tattoos. Now everybody's got tattoos. Actors and politicians got tattoos, so it, it doesn't mean the same. But when we were young, we all had tattoos and we were alone in it. Nobody, you could walk down the street, people walk away from you because you look, I don't want to be with this tattooed guys. I got tattoos on my arms, my legs, my stomach, and back. And here I am, this kid. Now I'm painting murals. Now I'm going back to high school. Now I'm getting involved in the Chicano movement. And um, it changed my life to the point that when I was 18 years old, I, uh, I decided to give it all up. The la vida loca, the crazy life. I gave it all up and I had to because I was gonna die. People were dying around me. And, um, and if you ever get a chance, I would recommend you all read this book. Um, if I have it here available, let me see. Oh, I know where it is. It's my newest memoir. It calls you back. I don't know if they have it outside or not. I don't know. But if they do, I would get it. Because this is, tells you the 40 years after Always When You Finish. But in here, it starts off when I'm trying to leave heroin. And I didn't include it in Always Winning, but I did include it in here. And just so you know, my first heroin withdrawals was in the county jail. I was facing my first prison term, and um, instead of joining the, the prison gang, joining all the politics, I was already a revolutionary Chicano. And I told these guys, my homeboy ran the kitchen for the big prison gang. And uh, he told me, you gotta, be, you gotta join in, you gotta be part of the, 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 the blue soldiers, as we call them. Um, and you gotta be part of the, it was Mexican mafia in those days, and you gotta be part of it. And, they were trying to get me in. I told them, I don't want to do this. Said, what? Are you crazy? Uh, I was arrested for trying to defend a young Mexican girl who, she was young, 27 years old, but she was getting beat up by the sheriff's deputies on the ground while she was handcuffed. And everybody was walking away, and I couldn't. So I tried to get in the way, and sure enough, they jumped on me, beat me up, and then put me in jail and tried to get me for assaulting police officers, which is a minimum of six years per officer, and there was eight officers involved. They could have given me a lot of time. So I'm, I, I figure I'm gonna do the time, but I just didn't want to be in that, in that life anymore, you know what I mean? I wanted to be a revolutionary Chicano, that's why I told him. And my homies were like, are you crazy? And then what are you in here for? Did you, would you steal? Did you shoot somebody? No, I tried to protect this Mexican girl from getting beat up, and they go, are you nuts? Who does that, you know? No gangster does that, of course. I wasn't a gangster anymore. I couldn't tell them, I really wasn't. And then the first thing I did to prove to them is I started my heroin withdrawals there. I said, I don't want this stuff no more. Heroin is the hardest drug to leave. Anybody who's been on it knows what I'm talking about. Nobody really wants to leave it. It's very hard. But I knew one thing, it was my enslavement. I was a slave to heroin. I needed to for be free. Prison could have been another enslavement that I didn't want it to be. I wanted to be free even in the book behind bars. And I knew that I had to get out of heroin. So the very same guys that were gonna set me up, because in the county jail in LA you can get any drug you want, were the very guys who also said, we'll get you clean. And they did. And, um, and just so you know, 
I was, um, um, the community stepped up on my behalf and wrote letters to the judge and they showed up in court and the judge decided not to give me the state prison terms. And all, all the cops were there clamoring for me to get to go to state prison. And the judge says, no, I'm gonna give them a break. It actually was like the fourth or fifth break, but you know, it wasn't a second chance, it was like, you know. And um, he let me go after many months in the county jail. He says, time served, go. And I didn't, and, they, and I got convicted. If anybody ever wants to look it up, it was for resisting arrest and drunken disorder, two misdemeanors. I ended up my crazy life in a whimper, you know. But it was a community that stepped up that saw something in me. And it was my mentor who helped gather people. And, uh, and, and I never looked back. I've been crime free and gang free and drug free for 40 years after I let go of that. And, uh, but I, I do want to read you a poem because there's another thing about that happens if you're beginning to travel a certain road. Things happen. Angels come out of the woodworks to help you when you least expect it. And this is one poem about, I'm still a heroine on this, but I actually won a writing contest in Berkeley, California. They gave me 250, it was honorable mention. It wasn't even the main winner, but they gave me $250. You know how much money that is in 1973? That's a lot of money. And for writing, I used to make money just by stealing, you know, or whatever, you know, but I mean like, now I'm getting it for writing. So I go to Berkeley and I'm going to my first poetry reading I ever went to. Because all that writing I was doing, I didn't know what I was doing. I, poems? What's that? This is the poem I want to share with you. It's called Fevered Shapes. Because I got to meet three great poets at the time. Some of you might know who they are. One, Jose Montoya. Anybody know who he is? He's considered the godfather of Chicano poetry. He just recently passed. But at the time, he was a young man really doing great poetry. David Henderson the leading, at the time, African-American performance poet. He was the other poet, can you imagine? These are like some of the best. And the third guy, which you guys should definitely know, Pedro Pietri, the Puerto Rican poet, oh my God. There were three amazing poets at this reading. So I'm sitting there, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting. I need some heroin, I'm hurting, you know, I'm sitting there, and I, want to, I don't want to be there. But this is what happens. I, I was trying to get out of there, I was trying to leave as fast as I could. And I couldn't, and it goes, it's called, it goes like this. I wallowed in a needle-spawned world, addicted to dope and the crazy life, and yet there I was in Berkeley for my first poetry reading. I was 18 with a bullet, as they say. Earlier, I had flown on a plane for the first time. Sure, I've survived half a dozen gun assaults, cops knocking me around, ODs, blades to my neck in jail cells, homelessness in dank streets, and beatdowns and body of brawls. But flying? That scared me to death. I sat there in a crowded cafe not knowing what to expect. Poetry? I never heard this before. Oh, I had written lines, vignettes, images, fears, thoughts. I didn't know they were poems. I had no idea what a poem was. First up on the mic was Jose Montoya with Chicano prayers of old pachucos and strained loves and guitar solos in Indian hands and cornflower. Then David Henderson took the stage, cleaning urban black streets, racist stairs, Black Panther fury, and Southern cooking. Finally, Pedro Piazzi came up, Neo Rican wordmeister, flashing at various experiences with poems located in phone booths and real life wisdoms that made us laugh and shake our heads. I had never heard words spoken this way. More music than talk, more fevered shapes than sentences, more Che and Malcolm than Shakespeare. These poems came for me, lassoed my throat, demanded my life savings, taking me for a sunset ride. These poems were graffiti scrawls along the alleys and trash thrown tunnels of my body, the metaphoric methadone for the heroin hurling through my bloodstream, the lifeline I already had inside and didn't know. These poems were pool sticks, darkened gangways, a swirl of sunrise after the graveyard shift, a blood black yelling behind torn curtains, a child shrieking and nobody coming to help. These poems were shadowed and tense, startled doubts, sorrows without grief, the moon without sky, unknown melodies, the falling inside that happens when you push razor onto wrists. They came for me as I sank into my suicide 
while fidgeting in a chair, inching under the skin as I wondered why I even came. Jose, David, and Pedro, I was never the same after this. They came for me, and I've never let go. They came for me, and I've perspired poems ever since. They came for me, and all my addictions, my sorry-ass lies, my falling masks, my pissed-off wives, neglected children, angry friends, and back-to-back -back failures could never, ever take them away. So I want to end with that because um, I want us to remember not to throw our kids away, to remember that each one of them there's a Shakespeare in there. There's a poet, there's an artist, there's a musician. We don't even know yet that this environment, this society is poisonous to us and to our children. We have to change that environment. I know it's easy to blame the kids. I would take responsibility for what I did. I would take responsibility for the people I hurt. That's why I wrote about them. I would take responsibility to, to the point that I myself, no judge could do it at the time, but I myself sense myself, sentence myself to a lifetime of community service because I know I owe my community for the hurting that I did and the people that I hurt. And so I, that's what I do. Uh, but I want you to remember, this is an environment, it's an abhorrent one, mass incarceration, kids picked up for anything, more laws making more lawless. We got so many laws, it doesn't take much to be a criminal nowadays. Um, and just throwing people away and we're losing our youth, we're losing our best of our future. And I think that we're concerned as an older person that we not do that, that we go reach out like somebody did it to me. If every one of you could mentor one young person, we wouldn't have the kind of violence and the kind of alienation and the kind of addiction that you're seeing today. I'm convinced of it. Just take one young person under your wing. Where is that? Where is that? Why is that gone? Why do we lose these connections? And yes, sometimes those kids will give you a hard time. I gave my mentor a hard time. I don't know how many times I told him to drop dead. And he got mad at me a few times, but he always showed up the next morning. Always showed up. Never gave up on me. So I want to leave you with that. This is a community that we have to rebuild. We have to imagine it again, reimagine it, and then rebuild it. And we have all it takes. It doesn't take billions of dollars. This is not big programming. This is not all this laws that we have to make so that we, it's, it's in our hands to do now. And don't just think about it as just my race. Help each other, we're all in the same boat. You understand that? We're all in the same boat. And all of us can soon come together, which is again to reiterate why I don't like the political discourse, because they're trying to divide us again. Always, always a constant thing. Between walls, between what color, between what religion. They're dividing us in every way you can. We need all these religions, we need all these colors, we need all these voices, and still we can find the commonality that brings us together as a people and a country, right? And that's what we should fight for. So, I want to leave you with that thought, because if anything, all this writing, everything I do isn't just for me, it isn't just because it's great expression, it's because I want to impact this world. And I want you to do the same. I don't like what I see, but I also know that the best in our people is still there. You understand? It's still there. And I don't think that we're bound by racism, even if there is racism. I don't think it's natural to us. We just have to know how to fight it in such a way so that we, we don't get rid of all the people that, that may be lost in it. Just like we don't have to get rid of all the intolerance. Uh, we can get rid of the intolerance, but not be intolerant of the people. You know what I'm saying? That we can get rid of crime by making sure that people have a chance to live and that we give people the passions that they need to find their callings, everyone's particular calling, everyone's destiny. If we do that, I'm convinced and I will tell you this over and over again, we won't see the kind of crime and pain and suffering we're seeing today. Make it so that everybody can thrive and everybody can be healthy. You fight for the, that for everybody and it works for you. And I just, anyone, anyone last, last thing, I wasn't playing today, I'm going LAX all the way to Detroit, three and a half hours, no stops. And uh, I always have a prayer that I give. It used to be when I was on planes, as you can tell, scared to death as a teenager, you know, these heavy duty gangsters and they got on the planes and they're scared. But I used to pray just for me. You know, God, make sure I don't die, you know. But I started getting to the idea that, you know what, what if I pray for all of us? 
Because that includes me. But then we're all safe. What if I pray for every one of us to come home to our loved ones? Isn't that more better? So everyone, I don't know these people, but as far as I'm concerned, they all deserve to be here as much as I think I deserve to be here. And maybe some are better people than others. I don't care. I'm going to pray for all of them. You know what I mean? And then I know that if God's hand is in there, we'll all be safe. I'll be one of those included. You don't understand what I'm getting at. Let's fight for all of us to do well, and not just fight for a few to do well and forget the rest of them and find ways to knock everybody out. Everybody does well. You're not going to see the kind of terror that we're seeing today. So I want to leave you with that thought, and thank you all for listening, and hopefully we'll have a nice little dialogue right here uh, with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you. Right. Very sensitive hot mic here. Yeah. Thank you, Louise. Uh, we have time for some questions. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand, and I'll try to make my way around to you. We'll start here. You didn't mention if your behavior and your drug addiction caused you to be homeless or what, what came first. Mm. Yeah, and again, my story is complicated. A lot of it's an always winning. I couldn't quite get touched upon all of it, but just to point out to it, I was... Um, I was a kid that fell through the cracks. My mother and father were hardworking migrant Mexican people. They were good, law-abiding people. They, weren't, they were abusive only because um, everybody abused everybody <laughs> in those days. I'm saying that they weren't really trying to be abusive, but in those days, that's what everybody did. They beat the heck out of your kids if you didn't listen, you know what I mean, if you weren't paying attention. And it might have worked. My brothers and sisters it didn't work for me. And I got to the point where my mom would hit me, and I would just not cry. I don't care how hard it was. She would pick up the gancho, which is the, the, hook, the, the wire, the, the cinto, which is the belt. She would pick up a chancla, which is the sandal. She would pick up a tabla, which is the board, everything. She would find something to hit me with, uh, and it wouldn't work. So I was incorrigible, and I was in the street very early on. I didn't, I don't know how to say it, but I, I just couldn't be molded. You know what I'm saying? So I think my own nature was that I, I hated injustice and I could see it in my home and I didn't like it and I could see it in my neighborhood and the, the way the police and the, also the, the schools treated us, everything, and I just really took it to heart. But unfortunately, because I didn't know what I was doing, I went very destructively. In the gang, drugs, hurting other people. Um, it's all and always running. I did some terrible things. Um, fortunately, I never killed anybody. I mean. Uh, I was close to it. I shot people. They survived. I stabbed people. They survived. Um, but still, that's the world that I was in. And the heroin was just part of that world. It was like uh, 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 the biggest escape from all the trauma was heroin. You know what I'm saying? That's why in Vietnam, a lot of heroin addicts came out of it. Because you're in war, and I was in a war. And if heroin's there, you're going to go for it. So uh, that's the connection, I think. Uh, and I just have to say that all my brothers and sisters did not join gangs. I'm the only one that didn't get in trouble. I'm the only one. So I was like, somebody had a fall. It was me. I was an addiction counselor for quite a few years and had always been taught that no one ever really uh, is cured from heroin. So I'm like elated to know that you kicked that and, yeah. and people need to know that because most people are taught that once you're a heroin addict, you, you go on to something else that you always have to do. And for 40 years, that, that's something. And my question is, how old are you? I'm 62 this year. Okay, thank you. And, 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 let, me, yeah, and let me explain. I've lived it that long. That's a good way to applaud. It's a good reason to applaud. Let me just explain. I actually um, I gave up heroin, but I drank for 20 years on top of it. But I don't... I, I do, think that addiction is a lifelong thing that you have to carry with you, like some people say. Um, I, am, I gave up drinking after 20 years when my son, who joined a gang, and he was the son that saved my life. This is like this guy's picture, I don't know, he's got a baby, he's got a little homie, he's got a baby, that was me. That, that's not me, but it was like me, with my baby, and he saved my life. He was 20 years old and he was born, and I made a promise to him that I would be the best father, and I would never be back on heroin. You know, that was one of the biggest catalysts for not going back, but then I drank, and I didn't think twice about it. Drinking, drinking was everybody drinks, and I actually was a pretty good drinker. I could drink till I blacked out, and I wouldn't, you know, I, I didn't care. Uh, 
But 20 years of that destroyed more my body, destroyed my family, destroyed relationships, and I was losing my sons. I have three sons and a daughter, and I was losing them all. And so I finally, finally, it took a long time. I went through a recovery program. I have finally been sober now for 23 years this June. I'll be 23 newborn. But I do think addiction can change. But what has to change is the environment that allows the internal change to happen. Because as long as there's alienation, disconnections, uh, a sense that you're not, you, you feel empty all the time, you're gonna go become an addict. If you begin to fill it with healthy things, and there are ways of doing it, it's less and less that you start needing that. And again, 27 years of drugs, heavy drugs and alcohol, I am now at a point where I don't, it used to be every day I thought about it. Now I don't think about it. I don't know, well, not as much. I do understand of the addiction <laughs> that that's a lifelong, yeah. Um, yeah. For a lot battle. of people, it's a lifelong it's, it's battle. A lifelong yeah. battle. Yeah. But I had always been taught that that once you were on heroin, that you could never really kick it, and yeah. that's why that to me that says a lot because yeah. I think some people are taught that or they learn that, and they think they can never get away from that. Yeah. And and with the the crisis that we're seeing in yeah. this country right now with heroin, yeah. I think parents need to know. Family members exactly. need to know, as you have shown us here yeah. tonight, that it can be kicked. Addiction will be yeah. there, but you can get, you can kick the heroin part. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I have to say what you just repeated again. You can kick it. And heroin, it's the worst drug to leave, the hardest drug to leave. It's not bad. It's crystal meth is worse. There's a lot of other drugs that do more damage. But heroin, you don't want to leave it. That's the sad thing about heroin. If you're a crystal meth head, you want to leave it. You, after a while, some people don't, but you know what I'm saying. Some people do. It's just so horrific that after a while, I want to get I remember PCP heads. They were completely like, they had to leave. Heroin, you don't want to leave. You know what I'm saying? So it's one of those things. But I will tell you, just so you know, you don't have to be bound by it. And there are statistics that prove that heroin addicts have left heroin. There's many of them that started, like when I was a youth, that are no longer heroin addicts. Some stay to the 20s and 30s that are no longer heroin addicts. And it's less and less as the ages go by. You know what I'm saying? There's still, I know a guy was doing, using heroin for 40 years. He's one of the last, you know what I'm saying? He's one of the few, there's not that many like that. And the reason why he stopped using it because he has no more collapse. He hasn't, all his veins are collapsed. He has no more veins he can shoot up. He was shooting his eyeballs. He was shooting every, everywhere he could. Yeah, in his mouth, his, you know, everywhere he could. He couldn't shoot no more. I mean, you got veins inside your body, but he couldn't, no more veins, so he had to quit. But the point is that becomes less and less. There's a lot of people that try heroin as teenagers, by the way, and if they get the right connections and help, they can, they can quit. And then the next few don't until they find it. And then you have the last few that just can't. You know what I'm saying? So thank you for that. Good evening. Um, almost 20 years ago, I saw you as a senior in college at Ohio University speak to our students. I was a senior in college. No, I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now I'm, I'm at Bowling Green State University. Cool. Um, and I know that I've grown a lot in those 20 years. So my question to you is, how have you as a person, as an author, how have you grown? What have you learned? How have you changed since those earliest books until now your latest memoir? We can start another discussion if you want. And uh, uh, I think one of the things I want to maybe relay here, what happens, the consciousness growing is very important. You have different kinds of consciousness. At a certain point, you have the basic survival consciousness, right? The reptilian brain one, the one that fight, flight, flee, or freeze, whatever it's going to be, you know, whatever you're going to do. And then you have another consciousness, maybe it's a striving consciousness, you know, that you want to strive, but you're not really stuck on that. And then maybe you have a kinship consciousness. There's so many consciousness. But here's what I learned. The higher consciousness you, and anybody can get there, and I've seen heavy-duty gangsters get there, the more it's nested. You can always tap into all those other consciousness, but you have other layers that you can tap into. What happens if you get stuck in this consciousness, you don't have the top ones to pull from. All you can do is go to the bottom one, you know what I'm saying? So what I would say, what I've learned in 62 years, after everything I've been through, and I saw my son, he did 15 years in prison. I saw him get lost. I saw so much suffering. I had close homies that have changed their lives. Three of them committed suicide in the last five years, people who I love. You know what I'm saying? This is heartbreaking work that I do, but my consciousness is getting stronger and stronger. Now, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm at the end of the road. <laughs> I gotta look at the other side now, you know? But that's kind of like what eldership is, isn't it? 
Partly you realize you know more, you got wisdom in the bones. I don't mean just in your head, you got wisdom in your bones. And you begin to give to others. And you know that I'm facing the other side, but let me leave this legacy. Let me leave this place in the world that's healthy and strong, even though my life hasn't been that way. And that's what I've learned in all those years. Have a nested spiral that you can keep tapping into deeper consciousness. And you can always tap into the other stuff, but just remember you have other consciousness you can use to benefit you. I can relate to everything you're saying, uh, and uh, you're an inspiration. Thank you. I had a stroke last year, July 15th, because of all the partying I did, mm. and I was in a coma for 17 days. I got paralysis on my right side, and I've been mm. through that rough life. And uh, but there's a better way, man. And uh, you inspire people when you talk. Yeah. You uh, know, there's a lot I can say, but I'm just gonna leave it like that, well, man. Thank you, you so you, uh, much. That you say a lot, lot of things, man, that make thank a lot you. of sense, and I can understand everything yeah. you're saying. Just, um, it means a lot to me, and just so you know, I've, I go to prisons. I didn't do all that state prison time, but I never forgot that all my homies did. So for 35 years, I've gone to the worst prisons you can imagine. Not only in California, which includes San Quentin, Folsom, Soledad, some of the big ones there, Illinois prisons, I've been to prisons in Connecticut, New York, Texas, Arizona, I've been to some hardcore prisons. Uh, I've been to prisons in Mexico, which, by the way, are some of the worst ever, but El Salvador. I went to seven prisons in El Salvador. Some of those places, no human being should ever even be near, and yet I was there. I went to prisons in Guatemala, Argentina. I went to prison in England, Her Majesty's Juvenile uh, Offenders Institute. I mean, everything's Her Majesty over there. But, uh, <laughs> but I, in other words, why do I say that? Because I believe in people. I go to maximum security prisons. I work with people nobody wants to work with. And I give them the same story, the same thing, because I believe in any one of them. And some of them, maybe they're older, but they still could use an inspirational moment, a little epiphany. They still could use somebody reaching out and saying, yes, you can change this world. You can change your life. This is the narrative that's not being told. The narrative we're told is that we can't change. They're never we're told is once a gangster, always a gangster. Once a heroin addict, always a heroin addict. Isn't that the narrative? We're always constantly told that. I see it in TVs. I see it in movies. Even police officers who, by the way, I don't hate police officers. I've seen them kill my friends. I've seen them do terrible things, and they still do terrible things. But I don't hate them, because you know what? I have family members who are not police officers. I got people who I don't want to be killed either and I care for them, but here's what we do to police officers. We mess them up by making them the answer to everything. We don't do enough in the front end, and we think the back end is gonna be the answer. So I stand with them in that sense. We should do more in our community so that the police don't have to be the ones trying to solve all the problems, and they can't. They don't got the skill, and they're just abusing our kids and killing some of them. So the idea is I think we have to be at that point. Oh, things can change. People can change. The right environment, the right conditions, everything depends on time, conditions, and place. Get the right place, the right time, and the right conditions, anything can happen. Thank you. Um, you're a changed person, hmm. obviously. Uh, my question is about um, your years as a young person doing all that gang stuff and so forth. Um, remorse. Hmm. With, during those years, did you feel remorse? Hmm. Do, do you recall yourself ever feeling remorse? And if you did, yeah. did that come, where did that come from? Yeah. Uh, was it a learning or can you explain? So let me, I think it's a very great question. People don't understand this. Developmentally, and this is why I don't like children being tried as adults. Developmentally, they can't even they don't have the developmental capacity to take remorse the way an adult should have. So when I was into the gang, I started very young, 11 years old. You're talking about a baby, and I was given a gun very early. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know half the time what I'm doing. What you have to do is detach yourself from what's happening. What you, what you mean is you just, when, one time they gave me a rusty screwdriver to stab somebody. And I, I, you do it so you can see them in the eyes. This is how you get hardened. That's what the gang wants you to do, get hardened. You think, well, I'm going to stab somebody with a wrist. It's good ever, but I don't want to do it, you know? So what you do, you disconnect. 
And I remember stabbing him, and it, I was like floating. You know what I'm saying? My whole body changed. Everything changed. And when he screamed, it sounded like an animal far, far away. That's how disconnected I was. Because you have to. Because your humanity is, is now being put on the line. Most humans cannot do this. I was not born to be a killer. I didn't have a killer in me. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying I was capable of it, like a lot of these kids. But I had to be pushed in the situation, and here I am now, I, and I disconnected. And disconnected meant that I couldn't have no remorse. I couldn't feel anything. And then you justify it. Enemies, they deserve to die. Don't we all do that? Don't we do that when we go to Iraq and pack Afghanistan? There must be enemies. They're all terrorists, which is not true. It doesn't matter. If you think it is, then you justify all of it. You know what I'm saying? We're good. We're, that's like the great drive-bys, all these drive-bys that we did when we were kids and everything else. They do them over there, too. They don't have to see. What are those drones? They're not even human beings behind it bombing people away. We don't realize that we're part of the same mentality, only now it's at this level. And don't we disconnect? Don't you know that we're at war right now? And most of us don't even feel it. We're at war. People are dying. And yes, every once in a while, it comes back. Some terrorist blows people up here. And then we fart. Then we feel it. And then we're like, oh, what happened? But we're at war. The world is at war. And sometimes we don't feel it. So the disconnect is deep. And I think that's why it's hard to have remorse. I had to learn to reconnect to my humanity. I had to learn to feel again. And I call it, when I work with kids, I tell them, get conflicted, dude. Conflicted. You don't want to go in that world with no conflict. I want you to feel the conflict. I want you to feel like I'm going to stab this guy. Maybe I don't want to do it. You know what I mean? Get it conflicted. The only thing that's going to stop you right now is the conflict of needing to do it or not. And that's the start of rebuilding your humanity. Because I started getting conflicted. I started like, I don't want to shoot nobody no more. I remember when I was, the last time I was in county jail, we, the Crips were coming up. And all the Mexican gangs were stabbing Crips because that's what they had to do. It was like the Crips were coming up and the Mexicans were trying to take over all the prisons. And so I was in the holding cell and, they, and what they would do is the trustees would bring in the knives. We, we called them filetos. They called them shivs and shanks. and We called them filetos, filetos. They were bringing the knives and the trustees, the guys that actually worked with the prison system, they're, they're inmates, but they're the guys that supposedly done good. Anyway, they give you the knives, and then there's a special whistle, the gang whistle that we are, the vario whistle. And once that happens, you start stabbing Crips. I didn't want to do that. And I was already like, I ain't going to do this. My, my, my conf conflicts had finally broken through. I wasn't disconnected no more. Now I realize I don't want to do this no more. And that's what to, this is what I do with young people. I try to get them to be conflicted so they can start getting back to humanity so they can get the power of re what real remorse means. You know what I'm saying? Because right now, kids don't have it. We don't have it. And guess what? I don't think some of these political people have it. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying, telling you, the things they're saying, some of the stuff, there's no remorse. There's no bad feelings. They say whatever they want to say and walk away. There's nothing to pay for what they, they say. Some of the things they say is like, are you kidding me? And then nobody's getting him for it. Remember Donald Trump said that he could shoot somebody in Fifth Avenue and nobody would complain? He's telling the truth. <laughs> That's the sad thing about it. So anyway, I'm just saying remorse is important, but you have to build it up when you've let go so long, and especially if you kill people. And there's people who have killed people that I work with. And you guess what? They're never going to kill again, but they will always have that in their life. They will never lose it ever. And that will be something they have to be working with and living with as long as they live. Thank you. Hi. Can you talk more about how you, you talked in the beginning about how writing is your destiny and how at first you didn't know what you were doing, but can you talk more about how you developed yourself the art of writing and hmm. um, the act of writing and just what that looks like? Do you write it and say it out loud? Do you scribble? Do you have somebody read it for you? Or yeah. what's, how did well, you... I had to do several art. things. One is I had to get skills in writing because I realized I loved to write. I didn't have no skills. So that was my problem. You know what I'm saying? I went to school at night as an adult. I went to East LA College at night to learn writing. I took creative writing, journalism, and speech because I didn't know how to do even talk right. And I wanted to dominate the English language. People say, why did you do it in English? Because I, I, I knew English is the language of my country. And even though I don't want to lose my Spanish, I still speak Spanish. I needed to write in English. You understand what I'm getting at? I wanted to write to the world, to America. I wanted to write to you all. And I needed English, and I dominated English. So I went to school, got the skills, and I ended up going to journalism school. I got a certificate out of UC Berkeley in 1980, and I ended up working as a journalist. That's what helped me 
get into the writing thing. And then I never lost the poetry, never lost all that. All my books, genres, I got novels, I got short stories, I got poetry, I got children's books. I didn't, I didn't even show you my children, one of my children's books, you know. So I have done all that because I wanted to learn the skills. And then the way I do it is that I write as much as I can every day. If I can, two or three hours in the morning, I'm a morning person. My wife's a night person, so we don't get along in that sense. We're kind of out of sync, you know, but uh, I get up early, five o'clock in the morning. I read and or write, and I love it. I spend time doing this, and then I can get my other work later, later on. But that's what I do, and I, I uh, do my own editing, but I also have people that help me. I have publishers. I've been published by Simon & Schuster, some of the big boys, and I've been published by small little presses like Curbstone Books out of Northwestern University Press. So in other words, all gamuts. But I would say get the skills, write all the time as a practice, just like anything, and then don't ever give up no matter how bad it is. Being a poet is one of the hardest things in the world to be, being a writer in many ways, but I never gave up. I told a story to somebody that when I first did my, an, a book, I sent it to all these New York publishers in the early 80s, and I got 22 rejections. And I would have got 23, uh, but what happened is I gave up, I, I gave up except for the 22 letter that they sent me. They always gave me these standard letters. Sorry, we don't, somebody, an editor wrote me a letter and he, what he said was this. He had, they had published, this is a big time publisher. They had published a quote Hispanic book 10 years before and they felt that they had done enough as far as Hispanic literature was concerned. So that was good he did that, you know why? Because now I got mad. <laughs> what? So now I'm writing and, I'm, and, I'm, and now look at me with all these books. I'm glad I got mad. I'm glad he did it because that got me going. No, no. They weren't even looking at my writing. They weren't going to publish Luis Rodriguez. So I finally decided, no, I'm going to keep doing it. So whatever you do, don't give up. If this is your passion, this is what you want to do, don't, please don't give up. We need to hear from everyone that wants to be a writer. Yeah. Um, what's the relationship between poetry and fiction and memoir uh, in your practice? Well, and I know this is kind of like I don't want to be like an English teacher here, but here's what I would say. Everyone has a different dynamic. There's poetry and short stories, right? But the dynamic in a story is story. You know what I'm trying to get at? There's narrative and poetry, but the dynamic in poetry is language. You see what I'm saying? You don't want to lose that. There's uh, obviously the story and even poetry in movie making, but the dynamic of movie making is the visual, what, what's happening in front of the, the front of your eyes. You see what I'm saying? Or the theater. You've got to know the dynamic of each genre. So you, I don't want to be away from it. But at the same time, as you know, some of my short stories have some poetry, poetic moments. Some of my poems have narrative and all these things, but I still stay true to the genre. You know what I'm trying to get at? And, it, and then you can mix it up too. It's okay, as long as you understand what each genre does. And that, I think, is the important thing. It's understand visual, hearing, feeling, all these things. Poetry is a very emotional, connective thing. So I try to make sure that that's where I do most of my emo emoting in my, my poetry. So that's important to understand what each one does. Can you speak a little bit about how it has been for you in terms of your son mm. who was in the gang in, in prison and yeah. how, you, how had you have dealt with that over the years? So he became the reason for always running, the reason for it calls you back. And almost everything in the last few years has been about him. <laughs> And because he was the one that saved my life as a kid, 20 years old, I held him, you know what I'm saying? And some people don't get changed with kids, I, I did. But I'm gonna tell you what the sadness of the drinking and trying to leave all this stuff. Two and a half years later, after me and his mom had broken up, I abandoned him and his daughter. I did the worst thing I could have done, not be there for him. And both my, his daughter and him suffered a lot. And, um, and I suffered a lot not knowing how much I was causing pain. So when I moved to Chicago, my son eventually gets sent over. He's 13 years old. And now he's, because he was getting ready to beat up his mom of all things. You know, he's going crazy in school. And uh, he was, she said she was going to choke her. I don't, that's not what happened. But he still, he was going to hurt her. And she sent him over to me. So now I'm a, I'm a dad at 13 years old. And I already have a little baby with my new wife. You know what I'm saying? And here I am trying to deal with all this stuff. And it was really hard and I couldn't handle it. Two years later, he joins a gang in Chicago. And I didn't want him in no gang. I was trying to stop him. He would run off like I did when I was a kid. And I have a beginning of always running where he's running away 
from the house and I'm chasing after him. And he's, you know, in Chicago with the gangways and all the buildings. And he knew how to slip in and out of buildings. He was popping up here, popping up there. I don't know how he did it, you know. He was climbing fences and he was getting over. And, uh, and then I, it was really my voice that I heard. Because he was saying, you know, get away from here. I don't want anything to do with you, you know, so-called dad. And uh, it was my voice, you know what I'm saying? I was, he was, I was going back to when I was 15. And uh, so it was really hard for me. I finally brought him back home, but it, it was really hard. I ended up trying to help his homies. I brought his homies to the house. We'd have meetings in the basement there in Chicago, one of the, the, the three-story flats. And we had there where all the homies, uh, mostly Puerto Rican kids in Humboldt Park. And uh, I was helping a lot of his friends, but I couldn't help my own son. And when he was uh, 17, he started his first prison term. And then um, at 21, they gave him 28 years. Um, and everything seemed to be like worse and worse and worse. But I will tell you, and this is why I, I can only tell you how fortunate I am. Uh, he ended up doing 13 and a half years of the last stretch. He didn't do the 28 years. He did up to 14 years. He could have done 14 years with a good time. Because in those days, you, you had to do 100% of your time, 85 to 100%. It was declared unconstitutional. He fell in right at that moment. And now you have to do 85 to 100 percent. So he could do it with good time, and he got out actually six months sooner, 13 and a half years later. And now he's been released for six years. And just so you know, he's doing very well. My son is doing very, very well. <laughs> Gang-free, crime-free, and drug-free, like I say about me. He's been that way now for several years, and now he's an Aztec dancer. He's a, living with me in, in the community. He's helping the youth group there, and he goes out with me when I speak to kids. Only now he's going to Cal Lutheran College, and he's also working. So he's doing very well. He's 41 years old. It's about time. <laughs> Took him a long time. 41 years old. He's not a little kid, but he's also a father and a grandfather. So he has to now think about his his legacy and his children. So I don't know how much more we got. I think it would time for one more. One more, one more. I would just like to say that I grew up in a rough neighborhood too, kind of beat the odds, and now I work in a professional setting. Um, sometimes when people talk about things and they hear my background, they're actually very surprised. Mm. Um, and I still deal with a lot of friends and family who are addicted in gangs and in and, and the life. My question to you is, these people that aren't interested in leaving haven't gotten to that point yet. How do you mentor them? How do you stay there for them? How do you support them? Well, I think that if, when I work with all these kids, one of the things I have to demand of them, because this is what my mentor did to me, I have to want to change. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because um, it's internal, the change, and it's very important that they have to want it. Uh, what my mentor told me that of all the homies that I was with, all my the homies, he said that I was the angriest and the hungriest, and I couldn't understand him, because there was a lot of raging fools in my neighborhood. I wasn't that angry, but he said, no, no, you were angry at the injustices of the world. Most of these guys couldn't care anymore. They weren't angry like that. They were just raging at the world. They didn't even know what they were angry about. You still had eyes, he said. He said, anger has eyes, it has direction. When you're raging, it's blind. I always remember that. So he taught me that I still had anger, but he also told me I was the hungriest. You know what? I was the hungriest for something new. I was the hungriest for something amazing to happen. I was really hungry for something to be different. And that's the kind of people that I find in the neighborhoods, and they're there, and I work with. Now, for the ones that don't want to change, I can't do much for that. Even though we offer people all these opportunities, and it's up to them to make that step. See what I'm saying? Because they have to be the ones that say, it's my life. And I always tell them, this is your life. This is not my life. You have to make something of it. And I'm going to give you all the tools and resources, but you're going to, I'm not going to save you. You're going to save yourself. That's really what I end up telling them. So that's the work that I do. And generally, by the way, most guys, hardcore guys, are willing to go that way. If you hang in there long enough, if you work with them, and I don't give up on them. They generally give up on themselves first. And yet there's guys that I know I've worked with that aren't, aren't going anywhere. They're not changing. Uh, I still think they're capable of it, but right now they're not. And if they need me, I'm there. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, it took some guys 40 years to finally get to come around. 40 years, a dude, you know, come on. But anyway, it, it doesn't matter. I'm still there if they need me. And I'm not saying that people don't try to use me. I know people that try to, because I might, my book, I'm, I know people that want, after a while they start saying, hey, can you give me some money? Can you, uh, can, you know, how about some always running money? Oh, they think I got money. They have no idea, you know. <laughs> So uh, 
what I do is I never, I never get involved with crimes with them. I never give them money. And I never, um, how do you say, uh, try to enable them. But I do, unlike a lot of people, hang in a long time. I can hang in a long time. And that's generally, in the long run, what helps people. I'm still hanging in there because somebody did it to me. See what I'm saying? And even my son, after all those years in prison, he did close to 15 years in prison, I hanged in long enough. And he realized, he even told me, after seven years in prison, he finally got that. You know, every guy in prison, I would tell him, you're going to have that moment when you realize, what have I done? What a waste. You're going to have it. You don't know when. It could be two years. It could be 20 years. You're going to have that moment when you're sitting there in your cell. What a waste of my life, you know? And my son had it seven years because he wrote me. And I remember. And he says, Dad, I finally understand what you're trying to do. I finally get it. So, thank you. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. You guys were wonderful. Thank you very, very much. And I'm going to go be out there and sign some books. Thank you.